make sure my no call all notifications off because that has tripped me up so many times. You're hit the cold. Get all the basics done, right? I haven't done a million podcasts myself and balls it up so many times. <laughs> you learn the hard way. Right then. So let's dive into it. So um as you've all just heard in the introduction, today we are joined on the Profit Cod podcast by Andy Ramage from One Year No Beer. Um and you know, Andy's done a great job of setting up something that's going to support a lot of the people that listen to shows like this. So if you're a trainer, I want you to be thinking in relation to what your clients deal with regularly. Um, and if you're a client, obviously, hopefully a lot of Andy's story will resonate with you. So first and foremost, Andy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, delighted to be on. I'm, I'm really lo looking forward to this because this is a conversation that I've been dying to have for a long while is to sort of reach out to the PT community and many of their, their clients as well, because I think this is a really important message to share. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Our, uh, our paths in terms of what we're trying to achieve uh, in the world definitely cross over. So um, this should be a, a great collaboration of, of worlds um, in my eyes. So for those, of peop those people listening that don't know you, Andy, just give us a brief rundown of your story, you know, your relationship with alcohol, where One Year No Beer came from, because I know it's an amazing story. Give our listeners a, a little insight into all of that. Perfect. All right. Well, I, my story starts at 16, I guess. I left school to uh, become a professional footballer or try to become a professional footballer. Um, I went to Leighton Orient. At 18, I got released, let go. You're not good enough, son. One of those moments, which was heartbreaking to say the least, but I didn't give up, right? And there's a lot of this in my story. You'll hear there's a lot of failure in there, but there's a lot of coming back and growing from those failures. I ended up at Gillingham, played professionally, scored in the professional league, one goal a thunderbolt from about five yards. But I did it, right? That's all I'd ever dreamed of, was playing in the Football League and scoring in the Football League. And I did it. And just when things were getting exciting, I was injured, career over, effectively. I then travelled the world, ended up in the city of London as a broker. You know, the guys, bright jackets, Wolf of Wall Street type of stuff, in the pits, screaming and shouting at one another. And I fell in love with it. It was like the closest thing I'd ever found to professional sport. It was fast-paced, it was electric, it was exciting. There was even slide tackles and the occasional sending off as I was always joke, right? Cause it was a load of young men in these environments, giving it some and uh, high stressor, high stress, high pressure, high reward type environment. And I excelled in it. You know, again, it, that footballing background, learning about failure and all those things, I think set me up mentally in the right frame of mind to be quite good at broken fast forward 10 years. And I'd sort of reached that, I guess that place that many of us, search for that place where we think happiness resides that sort of at the end of the success rainbow when you've got the house and the family and the car and the cash in the bank and all that sort of stuff and I did it I got there and I was so underwhelmed by it all you know I was like a five out of ten in terms of my well my well-being and my happiness didn't make any sense it was like one of those real sort of slow epiphanies as I describe it and I sort of looked around at the rest of the city of London and those people more sort of doing the classic air quotes at the moment, successful than me in a traditional sense. And I saw much of the same, broken bodies, broken minds, broken families, right? I was like, what is the point? What's the point of all of this? Why are we doing this, right? To chase this monetary dream. And then rather than sort of run away and do the whole, I'm off to a monastery and I'm going to rebel against the capitalist machine. I was like, no, do you know what? I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay in the job that I love and I'm going to start doing things differently. And that's what I did. I resigned from the biggest company in the, in the biggest industry to set up my own business, my own broken business. And as part of that, I went on a well-being adventure, you might call it. I went around the world to train with some of the best coaches, thought leaders, big thinkers, um, because I wanted to come back to the city. I wanted to set up a brokerage and I wanted to do it in such a way that I could be super successful traditionally and maintain my health, my happiness, and my family and all these type of things. And as part of that adventure, I took a break from alcohol. And I found it really difficult. And to, to set up exactly where I was with alcohol, you know, I described myself as a middle lane drinker. I was someone that would drink moderately, sometimes averagely, and occasionally heavily, which is basically everyone on the planet. It's probably everyone listening to this podcast, right? That's what we all do. And was it holding me back? Absolutely. It's not about problematic drinks. It's not about alcoholics, not about boxes. For me, it was preventing me being my best. It was holding me back from performing at my peak. And when I removed it, 
my life just got so much better, but it was really difficult. And in that struggle, it wasn't a physiological thing or a dependency thing. It was a psychological thing of social pressure. You know, I was a broker in the city. I entertained clients by taking them out and drinking and I was really good at it. And you try and turn that tap off and you turn up to meet the same clients the week after and say, I don't fancy drinking. That's just not an acceptable excuse. It's sad, but it's true. And I needed something to like cling to. And that's where the, the concept of this sort of challenge idea, because I thought everyone loves a challenge. I needed something to go into bat with, if you know what I mean, to get me over those first few days, which eventually I did after many false starts. And I became really intrigued. I became intrigued about psychology. I went back to university twice in the end, part-time to finish a degree and just recently a master's degree in positive psychology and coaching psychology, because I wanted to know everything about my brain. Why was I tripping up? How could I achieve this in a different way? And as part of that process, I eventually got to this sort of magical 28 days for me, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that was mad. And change it, right? So 28 days alcohol free, and I felt great. My eyes were bright again. I had a bounce in my step. I was full of energy. I thought, Do you know, I want more of this. I'm going to keep going. And funnily enough, about this time, people in my industry I admired said to me, your career will be over if you continue this if you if you stop drinking in this industry you are finished you cannot entertain you cannot build the relationships bullshit sorry for swearing because it is it's total bullshit right this is all just limiting belief stuff put out there by the world of people that are caught in a trap of just drinking mindlessly so i removed the booze got to 28 days i thought no i don't care i'm going to keep going then i eventually got to 90 days right my life just transformed I lost a lot of weight. I lost three stone in weight in the end. My body fat went from 30 odd percent down to below 10 where it is today. As mentioned, I got super fit, super healthy, went back to university to study. I got my time back. I got my consistency back and we'll talk more about this, but consistency is everything when you're training, especially around the way that you eat and the way that you train. What is the one thing that destroys our consistency constantly? It's alcohol. It's a night out that does you up for two or three days and you don't train as hard or you don't train at all. We've seen it a million times, right? And if you're drinking once or twice a week, as I was, I was never consistent. So I couldn't get fit. I couldn't get healthy. Remove the booze. Boom. I was in the gym every day. I knew I was going to turn up. I was eating really well because I knew I was going to show up. I wasn't going to crave stodge food and all that sort of stuff. So when all these things started to combine, I had this big transformation, not only physically, but mentally as well, I was fitter and sharper in my mind than I'd ever been. My relationships, and, and this is the most important thing for me, were better than ever because I was consistent in my relationships at home, my wife and my kids in the office. And the other thing is that I was able to show up every day in the office and I knew I was going to show up. And the job that I'm in, it's one of those. If you turn up and bang the drum, you'll do business. If you don't, you won't. So you've got to be on the ball. And that business that I set up, that new business that people said would fail, against all the odds, because we were a complete unknown, went on to grow seven times bigger in half the time. We are now the number one. I I stepped down from that business six months ago, but it's the number one business in crude oil um, in in Europe and in the US. It was a massive success, all because I took a break from the booth. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And then do you want me to continue to the one you know beer story? Just why? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. You're on a roll. Um, and as part of that, I wanted to sort of share the story. I didn't know how I was going to share it or what I was going to do with it. And I teamed up with another broker called Ruby Fairbanks, who had been inspired by myself and also taken a break from alcohol and got massive results. And here we were now. We were two going, hold on a minute. We're in an industry that tells us you need to drink. We've both stopped drinking and we're smashing it out of the park. There's got to be something in this. Our relationships are better. We're healthier, all that wonderful stuff. Let's share this. So he knew a lot more about the tinternet than I do. And we put it up on the web. I wrote a little ebook, 10,000 word ebook, put it up on the web, assuming a couple of people like us were going to read it. Four weeks later, 10,000 downloads all over the world, Brazil, China. I mean, you just couldn't believe. And people were resonating with our story that you're not giving anything up. What are you giving up? You're giving up nothing, right? You're gaining a massive advantage in all areas of your life. You just need to retrain your brain again. Um, And it was really resonating. And fast forward two years, we were well paid brokers we self-funded everything we wanted it to be free we built websites and communities and all that sort of stuff two years later and about 200 or thousand pound into it we went hold on this free stuff costs an absolute fortune we can't keep funding this thing and plus it was taking up every not just a bit of our free time 100 of our free time to do it we're still in the city running big jobs 
Um, and we were going to have to close down, which was such a shame, right? Because so many people were getting such a benefit from, you know, the, the messages that we, we were putting out into the world that we're about to close it down. And only by a fluke, I just created an online course. And I f it was quite easy to switch it on to a paid for online course. And I thought, you know, what? I'm just going to try this. Would people pay to get our experience, all the support around the psychology, the tribe, everything that's bundled up that has been working so well for so many people? Would people pay for that? And we turned off the lights literally for two weeks and said, look, we can't do this anymore. I flicked the switch to see if anyone would buy something. We came back two weeks later and it was like a little miracle. We'd sold five of these courses. We went, ah, the penny dropped. We were like, right, I get it now. We can create a business that does good in the world, a business that will generate income that helps people. And then we can grow this thing and we can grow it big and reach squillions of people. Because by default, for the business to work, it has to reach lots of people. And we haven't looked back since. We've thrown all our energy and our business acumen into trying making this into a big thing. And just around that time of that little epiphany and selling the, the four or five courses, Pam McMillan got in touch with us and said, would you write a book? So it all started to come together at the same time. So we wrote our first book, The 28 Day Alcohol-Free Challenge. And we haven't really looked back since. And now it's a big business. Six months ago, I stepped down from the world of, of Broken and the, and the firm that I co-founded to do this full time. And we're just loving it and living the dream. I'm reaching so many people. We're going in for uh, more investment now. I've just taken on, on the first round of investment, 1.1 million. We're going for another raise. And the reason we're doing this, and, and some people say, why are you trying to build a big business? Because in this area, traditionally it's charities and whatnot. Charities are struggling. They're hanging on by a thread at the moment. They're one tender away from closing. Like what the world needs in many ways, I think is business that does good in the world, that offers a different service. And in doing so, we're going to try and reach squillions of people. That is the mission that we're on in a sort of roundabout nutshell. That's awesome. Yeah. And for anyone listening, if you can't, if you can't feel the passion <laughs> that uh, Andy has for this subject, then the, there's something wrong with you. I've I'm, I'm got the pleasure of watching him explain it at the same time. So I can <laughs> see his, uh, see his face. Um, yeah, yeah. So like, when when I hear that story, Andy, it's like you seem to reach a point where you noticed that despite not having an alcohol problem in the traditional sense, you, you realized that it was holding you back in some way. Um, how how can people realize that? Because I think most people, did, you, did they feel some level of shitness all the time and that's normal like that's their normal so they yeah. never really feel any worse when they drink a little bit more you know there's always some level of alcohol consumption or whatever like how do we how do we help people get that little light bulb moment if they're always stuck in that haze of alcohol and that is such a brilliant point like i'd reached a point in my mid-30s where i just assumed that you're meant to feel a bit shit all the time. You're meant to be tired all the time. I mean, isn't it nuts? Here I am at 44, fit and faster than I've ever been. And really the reason we set up the challenge is we do a 28 day challenge, a 90 day challenge and a 365 day challenge. It's for exactly what you're saying, just to give people a glimpse. That's all it is. I know 100% if you come in and do a challenge or you take 28 days off the, the booze with the right mindset, by the way, not yep. that it's like a, I don't want to do this like a dry Jan. I'm forcing myself to do it in some ways and I'm going to hang on for dear life and I'm going to bemoan the fact that I'm not drinking. If you come into it with the right mindset, you will get that glimpse. You'll start to realize, actually, do you know what? I'm not meant to feel tired all the time or lethargic or stressed out all the time. You just get that glimpse. And that's exactly, you know, in my story earlier, what happened to me, I was like, ah, maybe I'm meant to feel like this. Maybe I'm meant to have that energy. So the best thing you can possibly ever do, and I say this all the time, is give it a try because you've got nothing to lose, right? And everything to gain. And here's another thing. If you do 28 days or 90 days, at least you can look yourself in the mirror at the end of that and go, actually, my life was better with alcohol in it then it's job done, right? You've made that decision. Whereas what happens is so slow and it's so sneaky, it creeps into our world and we don't realize it's holding us back until we remove it, if you know what I mean. Because our new normal is to be a bit tired and a bit shy and a bit inconsistent. And then we remove it and go, boom, I got my time, I got my energy, I got my consistency back. It's a game changer. And then there's a mindset shift around that that makes it so easy in the end because there's no willpower required. Because it's like, why would I drink? What's the point? I don't get it. It's not part of my healthy lifestyle. It's not part of my fitness regime. Why would I? It changes the game completely. Yeah, yeah. And 
I'm going to refer to the book because I've, I've listened to the book fairly recently and there's a few really key bits in there that I want to make sure we mention for, for anyone that hasn't read the book, obviously go and read it. Listen, like I listen to it on audible, um, like get a copy of it, but there's a couple of key points that I think will come across really well in this type of format. And, and one of them that relates to this light bulb moment is there's a quote that, you mention in the book well i've quoted you from the book basically and there's this line very short line and it says a lack of illness does not imply health and when i heard that it really stood out to me because i think sometimes because people haven't yet physically felt the problems that their lifestyle is eventually going to give them they just assume that they are fit and healthy they just assume that because they're not ill because they're not dying they are perfectly fit and healthy um and the reality is is that most people's relationship with alcohol is eventually going to lead them down a path of not being fit and healthy and being unwell um and we've got to nip that in the bud um so like i don't really know what my question is around that <laughs> per se but like wh why did you include that quote like that was was that something that you you noticed yourself like that although you weren't ill you weren't healthy like there must have been a reason that was in there. I thought it was quite a prevalent thing to include. Yeah, and that when I first read that quote, it it changed everything for me because I thought it was actually Dr. Phil Maffetone in a book behind me. Um, and I think, what's it called? It's something health, Dr. Phil Maffetone. I'll see it in a second. But I read that quote in his book and went, that is fascinating. That is so true. I think people's like usual stance is... I'm not ill, therefore I sort of must be healthy, right? Because I'm not actually sick at the moment. And they wait until they get sick and go, oh, no, now I'm sick. And then it's like playing catch up because yep. it's a bit late in many ways. Whereas I think you've got to look at yourself all the time and think like, what can I do to make myself most functionally vibrant and healthy? And it is ticking all the usual boxes that we know. And that is why alcohol is an absolute nightmare, right? Because it just gets in the way of all the stuff that we need to do it, it gets in the way of our consistency around the way that we eat the way that we exercise the way that we have quiet time you know and there was an argument that alcohol is great for connection but you know you can have the flip and the counter argument of that all the time because when you retrain yourself to be social and whatnot without it you still get that wonderful connection but you're even more sociable the next day if you know what i mean so all those fundamental elements to a life well lived on the whole it gets in the way of and that's why i think removing it it's so important. Like my story around the health thing. And then the reason why that resonates with me is that my dad had a treble bypass. This is when I was still drinking um, and overweight and stressed out and maxed out and doing everything you shouldn't be doing. And, you know, living this broken lifestyle, my, me and my two brothers, we went to get fully checked out the full like cardiologist swoop as it were of tests. I was the only one brother that showed heart disease. So I had heart disease on the calcium score I should have been a zero. I was like a six, right? Minimal but I had heart disease. Like for a 35 year old man, I should have been a zero. Um, and that was upsetting. That was disappointing. And I went back to the same cardiologist a year later, having been through this system and he'd given me some statins, all that sort of stuff. And I went back a year later and I'd not make, made any lifestyle changes at all. It was embarrassing. I went back into the same room. I was still overweight, still unhealthy. And he, I thought the cardiologist must see that all the time, right? Here was a warning sign. Here was a, like, it, it couldn't be more obvious than that. And I'd done nothing about it. But fast forward a year later when I'd stopped drinking and that's stopping drinking was the catalyst to all the other good stuff. I ended up eating a plant-based diet. I went from like that real meat eating salad dodger that lots of people are to this plant-based diet. And the reason I did that because I knew it'd be good for my health and I've gained confidence and momentum because I'd taken a break from alcohol, I thought, well, hold on. If the conventional wisdom told me I needed alcohol and that was complete bullshit, do I need to eat meat to be a man? You know, maybe I can try a different diet that's actually better for my health and makes me more productive and more vibrant. So I started to eat mostly plants and move the dairy and I felt fitter and more energized because I could tell what the food was doing because there was no fog of alcohol. Fast forward, I'm less stressed now. I'm exercising all the time. I'm fit again. I go back to the same cardiologist a year later. And when you walk into the room and your cardiologist says the word astounding about four times in a, in a row, you're on to a winner. And he went like, your, your resting heart rate's gone from 68 down to 44. You're athletic fit again. You've obviously lost all the weight. Your body fat's gone. You look really well. Um, cholesterol's amazing. But best of all, your heart disease, you've stopped it. 
but we were so interested in your results, we took a closer look and it looks as though you've reversed it. How cool is that? I mean, that is the game changer right there. And that came from the one thing. It wasn't alcohol that did all that amazing stuff, but it was the alcohol 100% that was the catalyst for all of that good stuff. That's why it's the number one change, in my opinion, everyone should make. It's a no-brainer. Yep. 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 And I think different, different people will have different catalysts, won't they? Like for you, it was the alcohol. Some people find a sport or an exercise that then leads them to eating healthier and sleeping better and blah, blah, blah. Some people try a different way of eating and that's the catalyst. But I think you're right. I think for some people, for, for people that have tried those other things that have tried the diets and have tried the exercise and it still hasn't quite created a, a full lifestyle change. Maybe this is the way, maybe this is the route, maybe this is the, the fog that needs lifting that will then make everything else easier um, and allow them to create a healthier set of habits um, because that's what this is going to boil down to, isn't it? In terms of creating this long-term change um, is, is making Absolutely. sure you build these habits. And my, my approach to life is this, right? We are everyday athletes or office athletes, whatever way you want to look at it, right? Why is an, an athlete trying to win a gold medal any more important than you trying to be better at your job or be a better husband or a better parent? It's not right. Because the end result is the same. The athlete's trying to win a goal to be fulfilled and happy and all those wonderful things. And the parent who's trying to be better wants to be fulfilled and happy and all those wonderful things. So why is it any different? It's not. But I think for the lay person or the everyday person, we've just missed out on that connection, if you know what I mean. So my approach is like, start treating your life like an athlete would a race. What are the things that you can do to make it better? And again, back to that point about the health, hidden health in many ways, is to look at everything across the board, your sleep, your nutrition, the way you exercise and alcohol. And if you were an athlete working with me one-on-one -on -one, and I looked at your score on the alcohol, for example, and you were drinking too much, I'd be like, that's got to go, right? If you, if you want to be a peak performer, you're telling me you want to be the best at what it is that you do, right? Whether that's to run races or play football, or be a CEO, that's got to go, right? Otherwise it's all just big talk. So I think for a lot of people, you have to re-engineer the way that you live and the way that you operate in the world. And one of the best things to do is to remove it, right? It's not about giving it up forever. But do remove it and experience life again. Because here's the secret. If you can retrain yourself to live an even more vibrant life without alcohol, it's the, it's the biggest win ever. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And something that, um, again, referring back to the book, something that stood out for me was one of the models you present in the book, which I've come across many times. But the reason it stood out for me in the way you described it is because of one of the sections in particular. So the model that I'm talking about is the idea of the way habits are created or the way that they play out. So you have a trigger that then formulates a routine that plays out. There's then a reward associated to that routine and that then creates a craving to fulfill that habit again in the future. Um, and I'm not going to dive into the, the model per se for too, too much because you do a great job of explaining it in the book. But the bit in particular that I think would resonate with a lot of people is the reward bit. Because what you mentioned in your book is that the reward some people get from drinking alcohol literally has nothing to do with alcohol at all. Like the thing that they're, they're looking for, whether it be the social connection or de-stressing or relaxing or whatever, it's quite often nothing to do with alcohol at all. And in some cases, in drinking alcohol, it actually does the opposite of the reward that they're looking for. If someone's looking to... <laughs> de-stress and relax and they have a skin full of alcohol and then have a crap night's sleep it does the opposite like so it's quite an interesting way of looking at that model can you just talk to us a little bit about because obviously you've done a lot of the psychology stuff now as well like say you've been and got a master's like just just run the audience through that cycle briefly and, and that reward section yeah so the way we look at it is is pretty straightforward you know in that habit loop there's the trigger routine reward like really in a basic sense so that the plan is to keep the trigger, to keep the reward, just swap the routine. Um, and the way you do that is for awareness initially. Exactly that, right? You know, actually look at your habits. And so maybe it's 6 p.m. on a Friday night, the trigger, everyone goes to the pub. And the reward of going to the pub is that you're relaxing, you're socializing, and you're having a laugh with your mates. And the routine is to drink alcohol. So at a really like basic level, you can swap that routine with alcohol-free alternatives. They're everywhere now. They taste amazing. They look the part. There's a placebo of it. You can still have a laugh with your mates, still enjoy the crack, still have the banter with all your wits about you. And if it gets a bit boring, because after 
four or five people are starting to repeat themselves and all that sort of stuff, you can duck out and have all your energy and all your vitality the following day after. So the way we look at habits is very much get in and swap that routine. Keep your triggers, keep the rewards, keep swapping the routine. Or you could do something completely different. For example, you could go, it's not all about exercise, but you could go to a spin class or to a Barry's or something. You still get that like group mentality, like wash out all that stress from the week, achieve it in a different way. So a lot of what we do, especially when you change habits around alcohol, it takes a bit more effort. You have to plan, right? But if you put in the work, you get the rewards are massive, but trying to wing it doesn't work. Just showing up without any prior planning and thinking that in the moment, in the bar scenario, you're going to make these wonderful rational choices. You just won't. Right? Yeah. But you yeah. just got to be honest with yourself. You just don't. But if you've planned in advance, you know exactly what you're going to drink and you've got a backup, then you've got a chance. Or if you've swapped out that routine and taken yourself out of the lion's den and you're going spinning or Barry's boot camp or whatever, then you're going to get that momentum of staying alcohol free. But assuming that you can just and I did this for a long while. I just thought I could walk into the bar and then suddenly, you know, order my sparkling water. It just didn't happen, right? <laughs> because you'd feel that pressure, that social pressure. You'd fumble and stumble. The first person asks you what you want to drink and it's like, uh, I'll have a beer. Yeah. And then it's too late, right? Then you're, you're, you're in the drink again. So all of this stuff needs planning and preparation. And just to hit something over the head that I'm sure many of your listeners are thinking about is the classic thing that people worry about when they take a break from alcohol is, will I be boring? Will it be no fun? You know, all this sort of stuff, right? That is the drinkers, like that's the last baton that they've got. It's like, oh, you're going to be boring, bore off. You're not drinking, all that stuff, right? Anyone who's, who's taken a break from alcohol has been through all that stuff. And only to say that once again, the best way to overcome that is to experience a bit of life alcohol free. And when you're laughing even more and you're building even more connection and you're having even more fun, right? Because you're not writing off your whole weekend due to a Friday night's drinking or whatever it is, and you've got vitality and energy back. You realize that actually you're bringing the fun, not taking away. And I just want to get that out there because that is that little seed of doubt that's sown by the masses or oh, you bore off. And genuinely, I was worried. I was worried my wife was going to run off with the, the postman or whatever it was, or, or you, do you know what I mean? Or my mates were going to disown me. Yep. How does that stuff happen? Do yep. you know what I mean? So I think, again, by experiencing this firsthand with the right mindset, you just smash all those limiting beliefs. Yeah. And I think the bit worth highlighting there that you mentioned was the, the idea of planning. I do think it's important. It's something we talk to clients about when it comes to food a lot. We sort of say to them, look, if you're going to go, go out for a meal, check the menu online beforehand, make your decision before you get there, have a backup decision for if they've not got that, food item in for any reason and same with your exercise plan your exercise for the week something crops up last minute have a plan b something you can do as a routine at home or in the office or wherever and it's that same mindset that just needs to apply into this other area that most people have never considered before um you know a lot of people are probably a lot more comfortable now about making decisions ahead regarding food and exercise but with drinking like you say it just becomes this uh autonomous loop that we fall into um it, we just go we're just like automatons really we just do what we've always done yeah <laughs> exactly and, and we do and we like to be part of the crowd right social pressure can never underestimate how powerful that is you know from that instinctual drive that kept us alive on the savannas you know you don't want to get rejected from the group right because it meant death so that is such a powerful innate drive within us so anything that seems to be pushing us away from the group like you know we're fearful of and that's why again it needs that planning and a challenge and a tribe and all those things are really important to give you that confidence and the courage to go do you know what? i am going to do something different like we run a survey of over 2,000 people and 97 percent right which is like unheard of in a survey really 97 percent, basically everyone said the number one reason they didn't take a break from alcohol more often was because of social pressure because of other people and that's something we really want to go after is that all right if your mates or your friends or whatever decide they don't want to drink it's not that you have to be like high-fiving them and like doing a little jig because they're not drinking but just be okay with it that's, yeah. that's sort of where we want to get to with this stuff that it's okay if one of the lads turns up or the girls turns up and says i'm not drinking tonight i'm like, all right fair enough you know, that, is, that would be the dream for us you know and, and i think that gives people a bit of space because i know how difficult it is to overcome that that social pressure so yeah i think that's a really important message to get there as well yeah and i think in in the book that's something you do a great job of is almost getting people to pre prepare for these social um like hazards i suppose that are gonna crop up along the way you know you even talk about 
speaking to the ringleader of the group and things like that and and getting them on side and things and it's stuff that sounds really simple but you would never think of doing like and i think that's why it like if you if you genuinely follow some of those principles you could see how it would work very easily for someone if you just take a few small steps some of it might seem a bit daunting but it'll make the rest of the journey so much easier um oh, absolutely go uh, go on andy were you going to say something then sorry so i was just agreeing yeah um and one of the one of the things just going back to that sort of habit loop thing one of the one of the things again that you mentioned as a as a little tool within the book is this idea of a five minute rule um and a, again when i read it i really like this because as a pt we like to give clients a quick win something that makes them experience um like a, a way of overcoming something they normally find hard in quite a simple way. And you, you describe this five minute rule in the book. So ra rather than me talk about it, would you mind just de describing that for us and, and letting us know how that works? Yeah. So really what you're trying to do is give yourself rational control back. So if you find yourself in that situation, for example, you're on an alcohol free challenge and you get that craving, that urge, you just come home from work and it's like, Oh, I love a glass of wine or a beer very often that's the emotional part of your brain starting to pipe up right which is a really powerful part of your brain so rather than trying to sort of suppress it and fight it you can almost run with it a little bit and say yeah sure you know it obviously this goes on in your head but just wait five minutes in five minutes you can have whatever you want and very often just that little time delay is enough to give your rational brain a little bit of space to actually enter the conversation to go nah, don't need it and I think that's really important. A lot of these little hacks are important. And I think another one is to remove the alcohol from the house. Yep. You know, it sounds slightly overdramatic, but it's so important, right? Because when that, um, that emotional brain, that um, primitive brain pipes up, it is super powerful. But if it's not in the fridge and you have to go down to the shop, any of those little barriers or that five minute rule are just very often enough just to break it up, to give your rational brain control again. And suddenly you get on a decent streak like me, you get to 28 days and then you become sort of unstoppable down the line. All those little hacks make a massive difference. Yeah, definitely. And I think that it's something that people have never been taught is like a toolbox of little skills that they can build and use and know when to implement them to help them on this journey. Um, again, it's something we try and do in the, in the fitness world is give people tools that they can use so that they can overcome things that they found difficult before. And I think simple one like that is really good our, our equivalent of that is uh when people find themselves feeling hungry we sort of say to them well is that hunger coming from your mouth or from your tummy you know and if it's coming from your mouth it's usually a boredom thing it's usually an emotional thing so we say have a sip yeah. of water give it five minutes see if you still feel hungry um, and it's a similar type of thing it's just overcoming that like you say that emotional part of your brain because very few of us are actually making as many logical decisions as we think we are. <laughs> we're, uh, we're completely emotional beings. Yeah, I mean, I'm fascinated by this. And this is a lot of the work that I do is really trying to sort of get in around that. Or there's a brilliant book that I'm sure you're familiar with, The Chimp Paradox. It's probably the best book that I've ever read on the brain. Yeah. Um, and all it talks about is chimps and goblins and computers. There's no like dusty studies in there and it's genius right it just explains how it all works that primitive brain that rational brain and you know using your rational brain to manage the primitive brain is basically the meaning of life in many ways and i think the skills that allow you to be clever and skillful about using that um, rational brain to manage the um, primitive brain that's sort of what we do really we give people those skills because you have to and that's why it comes back to planning you need to use that rational part of your brain to do all the planning, to structure everything, and then you just press play. You just execute. So if you start having conversations in your head, you're going to lose. You know, yep. or and that's where those five minute type of tips come in, right? Because you need to buy yourself some space again. But very often, if you're trying to wing it, that this is back to that point I made earlier. Whether it's food, whether it's exercise, whether it's alcohol, invariably you make the wrong choices because that primitive part of your brain is so much more stronger than the rational part of your brain. And then we get frustrated because it's like, hold on, how did that happen? Where did my salad go? Where did my you know, alcohol-free beer go? Because you're getting overpowered. But if you do the planning in advance, you can start to overcome those things. Yeah, yeah. And that's where we like to talk to people about the idea of, of things like decision fatigue and things like that as well. You know, more of these decisions that you make in advance, um, the better because we're not great as humans. We're, we're not brilliant at making good decisions repeatedly um we, you know if you have to make a lot of decisions you inevitably start making poorer decisions as you get decision fatigue it it's a part of your brain that almost wears out 
Um, it's quite an energy consuming thing to do. So the more you get into the habit of making the decision ahead of time, at a time where you are a little bit more focused, a little bit more motivated, then it makes it easier because it's as if you've already done it. You've already made the decision. You've already made the choice. Now it's a case of crack on, like follow through. Absolutely. And, I, and I'm all over that. And that's a lot of what we do. It's like set up your plan and then execute it. Do not have a conversation with yourself because you'll lose. But if you've decided in advance what it is you should be doing, just press play. Yeah. And that's when you yeah. get massive results, whether it's around your body or, you know, what it's studying. It's the same stuff. You've got to get a planned in advance. I'm a bit of a geek on this stuff, but it's so important. Yeah. Yeah. So if we sort of look ahead Andy like when I get someone like yourself on the podcast I always like to think uh, well talk to them about where they see their world going so for you obviously it's it's alcohol and things like that and helping people with this we've talked about social pressure um it's clear that it probably is the number one barrier for most people this idea of it's the norm to drink it's how you become part of the crowd it's, it's just the expectation as such do you ever see that changing? Do you ever, I suppose it's part of what your your business is going to be about is trying to change that in some way. Do you ever think we'll get to a point where actually the norm is to not drink moderately, not be a middle lane drinker? Um, what are your thoughts on yeah. that? I know obviously there's no clear cut answer to that, but I'd like to see where you see this eventually going. Yeah, well, I mean, I've seen how far it's progressed in the last five years, which has been massive, right? You know, when we first started this, you could barely find an alcohol-free beer, let alone know about movements and tribes and all these people out there and then celebrities and more and more people going alcohol-free because they've figured it out, actually. It prevents them from being their best. So it's made such progress in five years. And I know these things speed up because they yep. just gain word of mouth and people are on it. And don't forget as well, what we haven't spoke about, and I don't do a lot of this, the fire and brimstone, but ultimately alcohol is terrible for people. It's like smoking. It's a number one carcinogenic. You can't, we sort of forget all that stuff as well. Like at the moment we're talking about all these brilliant wins around productivity and performance and whatnot, but ultimately it's still like smoking and the research is there and the research, of course it hasn't really flowered, Right just like the smoking research was stunted in many ways, or there's confusing research put out there, you know, merchants of doubt as it were, you know, and, and, and the smoking industry, we've seen all this before, right? And you've got to assume that there's a similar thing going on with alcohol. If you look at the studies in over 50 studies, it's directly linked to cancer, specifically breast cancer, which most people don't know, right? So when that stuff starts to burst through because it's unstoppable and that's what's happening combined with all the wonderful benefits of consistency and whatnot and the fact that younger people are drinking less, I think it will move where the default state will be, I don't really drink, but maybe I drink on occasions. Where at the moment, the default state is everyone drinks for every occasion. I genuinely think it will flip. It won't disappear. The same smoking hasn't disappeared. But the default stance for most people will be that you know, I'm not drinking. And on that note as well, I think it's really important while we've got PTs listening that you guys are at the vanguard of it as well. You're at the forefront of this as well, right? This is an important message to get out into the world because not only is it going to make your clients healthier and fitter, they're going to be more consistent and they're going to get much better results. So you look like a hero. Do you know what I mean? You've yep. helped transform their lives in, in more ways than one. And, and, you know, we want to do more work with PTs to leverage what we do into what the PT does, right? Because we can be the experts in the alcohol-free field because I, I know for a fact, and I'm sure the truth is many, many times that you get flaked on at the last minute or that mystery bug turns up, it's a hangover, right? We all know the truth. It is. The only time I ever flaked on a PT was when I was hungover. I was never, ever sick. Do you know what I mean? It was always the same excuse. So for those reasons combined, plus with the fact that it's wonderful for people. And, you know, and again, as PTs, you're there, right? You're at the vanguard of helping people achieve health and vitality and fitness and success. There is no place for alcohol. There's just not, right? Maybe on occasions, and I get it, it's not necessarily, I choose not to drink because why would I? I? don't see the point. My co-founder drinks in control every now and again. I totally get it. I think there's a time and place if that's what you want, but it's not aligned. It can, it can never be aligned with a healthy, vibrant lifestyle. It just can't, right? It's ethanol. It just, it just can't be. Anyway, I get very excited about this stuff, as you can tell. Yeah, definitely. And so you should. So you should. Like, to, to create these movements, you've got to have that level of passion behind it. <laughs> um, exactly. So you, you've given us a bit of an insight, Andy, into, like, the types of results people generally see when they undertake these types of challenges. Um, some of it's obvious stuff. 
Um, but what I think would be great to dive into is maybe if you give us an insight into some of the results people get that they maybe didn't expect. And maybe along those lines, I think an important conversation to have is what type of mental health results do people get? Because we know that this is a massive issue at the minute. It's something, again, that's creeping into our world as PTs that we're trying to help people with using physical health to improve mental health. And I'm sure it has a massive carryover into what you do. So I suppose there's two things there, like what are the results that people get that maybe they didn't expect? Um, because I think the obvious ones are fairly obvious. And then what are sort of the mental health implications as well that you've maybe noticed or experienced yourself? Yeah. I mean, start with the obvious ones. I mean, massive weight loss yep. all around my own stories, three stone. We've got guys in there, eight stones, nine stones, yeah, it's just a constant theme, running theme, weight loss, and not just because of the obvious um, uh, respite in, in the calorific drinks, which is alcohol. It's all the other stuff that I've already spoken about. It's the fact that you're consistent in your exercise and all those things. That's why people get these huge results. Sleep is massive. Sleep improves across the board um, because alcohol destroys the quality of sleep. This is another thing. That's why you're always a bit jaded and a bit tired. Um, and then if we start fast forward, and I think to some of the the mental health benefits are huge, right? That morning after hang, anxiety, as we call it, um, that self-inflicted, like I would get it. I would get like a self-inflicted and, and I think, thankfully, I've never suffered with depression. I have suffered with anxiety, but only ever brought on by that morning after symptoms that led to full-blown anxiety, um, as it were. And it's, it's tough. It's horrific in many ways. Anyone has experienced it and it started to creep into my real world and then I removed alcohol and it disappeared and hasn't come back since. And I, and I feel very fortunate for that. But what happens, I think not only does it give you that clarity of mind and that, that better, I think, starting point in terms of your mental health, but what also happens, and this is really important, so many people self-medicate and I totally get that, right? So many people are in pain emotionally. They're in pain, unhappy marriage or a depression or an anxiety. And there's this thing, this like feels like an elixir, this alcohol thing that's everywhere and it's celebrated and it's promoted and you can drink and numb that stuff out. But ultimately it doesn't solve anything, right? It doesn't solve, it only makes the marriage worse. It only makes the symptoms worse. It's just like negative spiral down. So when you first take it away and we have to do a lot around this, there can be the sort of kickback almost because it's like, whoa, hold on. I didn't realize actually my marriage is, is breaking down. I didn't realize that actually I think I'm depressed. So it's really important for the first time, maybe in a long time, people are getting the opportunity to put measures in place to deal with those things in a proactive manner, whether that's counseling, whether that's medication, whether that's to go back to their GP. Like this stuff is so important because for years they've just bulldozed it with alcohol that's tripping them up in every area of their life. As we've already discussed, suddenly they get this opportunity to look at things with a clear head and know the symptoms and feel the symptoms because there's not the fog of alcohol. That stuff is massive. That stuff is priceless. That's what's changing lives in many ways because you get that dual processor of removing the alcohol. So you get all that vitality and energy and all that good stuff. You clear the decks in terms of your mental well being, And then you have an opportunity if you are struggling in that area to put the measures in place to solve it. And then you get that dual process of goodness where you're buzzing on every level. And I think that's why we get massive mental health transformations as well yeah yeah and I, th I think again it's something that you know it's it's growing in sort of awareness the mental health space but again i think the the link between alcohol and a few other things is yet to be fully thrown out there into the uh i suppose like the mass media or people just being aware of the link there so i think that's going to be an important message to get across to people in terms of results but like you say a lot of people might not even be aware they're suffering with something just because of this constant self-medication um and i think the minute they give them uh, and what's... Chance to experience a break from that like you say even if it's just 28 days there might be a lot that they start starts they sort of look at themselves and realize and go look things aren't what i thought they were and maybe this needs addressing properly um and taking care yeah, of absolutely and there's another point to this as well. Like, you know, lots of business and industry and corporately are out there with this wellness message, this mental health message. And it's wonderful, right? And there's mindfulness and there's cognitive behavioral therapy and there's counseling and there's nutrition and there's exercise. And then at the end of the month, they have a massive work piss up. It's just yeah. not congruent. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's pressurized people to go out and, and drink, which is just going to destroy all, all the hard work they've put in for the last month in terms of corporate well-being. 
doesn't make sense. It's not aligned at all. This is the stuff that I think is really going to change in the next few years because actually the penny's going to drop and people are going to go, hold on a minute, that does not add up. You're doing all this hard work for your wonderful employees. You're really getting them to this place of vibrancy and then you're going to smack them over the head with a massive free drinks night which destroys all the hard work it doesn't make any sense you know so yeah they're they're the things that are going to change yeah definitely and sort of changing subject slightly andy um before we hit record um at the start of the conversation we were talking about the fact that you've just finished writing your second book um it's not out for a while yet but give us a a little rundown as to what we can expect from that because i'm sure there'll be plenty of people that we'll go and get your first book off the back of listening to this and we'll then probably look out for the second one when it, uh, when it arrives later in the year. Yeah. So it's going to be called let's do this. So it's all about motivation, but it's all about the sort of contrary view in many ways, because I think what happens with motivation and all these things, science produces a result and then conventional wisdom jumps on it. For example, like the willpower dream that, you know, all you need is more willpower and you can be more successful and happy and whatnot trouble is willpower runs out when you do the research right so it's always going to trip you up and most people start off with not much willpower if you know what i mean hence the people that stumble and fumble around alcohol so there's a tendency then to believe well i'm broken i'm not doing it right everyone else has got willpower i don't you know i can't be motivated what's wrong with me when the truth is the masses are the same as you they all struggle with willpower but but the dream that we're being sold is this willpower dream but really it's for the it's for the minority, not the majority. So the whole book really breaks down a couple of those big myths and tees it up in such a way that actually for anyone who's maybe struggling or wrestling with any sort of motivational ideas or the classic New Year's resolutions that last a couple of weeks, it's designed for those people, the real people, people like me, like where I was. Um, so I take a contrary view in, in many ways of all the traditional sort of motivational tools and package it up in a masterclass, which is like a 28 day step-by-step guide to crushing any goal effectively. That is it in a little nutshell. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily relate to alcohol specifically. It's something that you can now apply to anything. It's, it's a model to follow to achieve anything in whatever area of life that you want to apply that. Exactly. Whether it's to get fit, get healthy, change career or take a break from alcohol. It's the same stuff. It's all behavioral change. Yep. Love it. Love it. That sounds awesome. And while we're on the subject of obviously what, what you're doing and what you're spending your time on, give the audience an idea as to what these challenges look like, because some of them will have never experienced them before. They don't even know they exist. You know, what goes on in a 28 day challenge? What do you guys actually help people do? How do they work? All right, cool. So when you sign up to a 28 day challenge, you get a daily email and video, basically going through all the psychology and the top tips and tricks and hacks a couple of which we've discussed today you also get access to the tribe which is really important right so you get all that psychology get all that learning get all that experience and a tribe of like-minded people which is where the game changes you know when you get in there and realize there's tons of people like you going through this at the same time there's tons of support around it from you can level up to -to one-to-one it's like a gym scenario so you can go in on a basic package and then you can do one-to-one if you want. You can do group classes if you want. Whatever you need to smash this challenge, it's there. It's available. It's ready. Um, and, and hopefully that's why we're getting some like, wonderful results. So it's exciting times. And the key to it are the longer challenges, by the way. 28 days gives you that glimpse. Yep. 90 days is when you start to crack it. Yeah, yeah. And we, we have a similar thing in our world. People come in initially for three months with a PT to get a they sort of dip the toe in see what this fitness thing's all about. And then you often find that when people see results, get results, become part of the community, that's when they stick around for a long time. So I suppose it's similar in that sense. We all all like to become part of something, don't we? Yes. And then it's a lifestyle and then there is no willpower, right? You just, you're just someone who doesn't drink or you're someone that exercises every day. And then it's easy, right? You can save all that willpower and all that uh, mental capacity for other things, for running marathons or changing career and all that exciting stuff. Yeah, definitely. Well, without being too abrupt here, Andy, in terms of drawing this to a close, um, I like to try and keep these fairly succinct in terms of episodes. We know how short people's attentions are these days. Um, so like you've, you've covered a lot of ground in a very short space of time. I think you know the message you've delivered there is amazing. Your story is completely inspirational. Is there anything that you want this audience to try and take away today and maybe implement themselves? 
Um, and sort of along those lines, where can people come and find you if they want to try one of these challenges or if they just want to find out a little bit more about what you guys are up to at One Year No Beer? Yes, I guess a couple of the takeaway messages are like there's nothing to give up and everything to gain, right? And you're never going to know unless you try. That's it. Just try it for 28 days. And if you feel amazing, you keep going. It's that simple. Um, In terms of the challenges, oneyearnobeer.com. It's all on there. You can take all the challenges and whatnot. I'm bouncing around Facebook and Instagram most days. I do a lot of live stuff on the One You Know Beer channels. Personally, Andy Ramage, MV for motivation on Instagram. I'm doing a bit on that. And then LinkedIn, Andy Ramage. But that's, that's all the bases covered, I think. Fantastic. So if you want to check Andy out and, and what him and his team are doing, you know where to go and find him. Um, I think it's worth, like I, I said to Andy before we started recording, I think this is something that people should genuinely give a go. I think they should really give this a, a thought and, and think, right, like we do with, training and things like that don't go it alone go and get a bit of help go and get a bit of support it's not a weakness to go and ask for help like if it's something you genuinely want to take control of get the help get the advice you know use someone that's been there and done it and understand your situation um and see what it's like like just dip your toe in and see what benefits you get it's it's surely it can only ever be a good thing um yeah and and just and just on that note, for the PTs listening, give me a shout, right? Because we want to work with you guys and incentivize you, you guys to encourage people to take these challenges. Why wouldn't we, right? Because it's a win-win for everyone. People get better results. They get their health and their consistency and their mojo. And you guys get better results. And the client gets better results. It's the ultimate win-win. Yep, yep. And as I said to you right at the start, Andy, again, before we recorded, there's a lot to try and help people with as a PT. You know, we're trying to improve sleep. We're trying to improve nutrition. We're trying to, you know, increase exercise adherence. We're trying to get people moving properly. We're trying to sort the posture out. We're trying to do all sorts of things. I've even mentioned mental health in there as well. And there's coaching elements. So if, you know, I I was sort of saying to Andy that if we can outsource some of these things and, and say, right, you know, go and get help from this guy with this because he's the best at it it just makes sense in terms of your service offering and you know what it means for your business in terms of increasing results and adherence with people. It just makes sense. So, you know, I think it's something people should be encouraging clients to go and get involved in. Um, so to tie it all up and it, thank you very much for coming along today. It's been an absolute pleasure, mate. It's been great to have you on the show. Thank you. No, absolute pleasure myself and keep doing what you're doing. It's fab. Cheers, mate.